So here's the clinical. Ulcerated, you know, fungating nodule coming off of the, the fourth toe. It's another, another angle to look at it. Nasty, you know, I'm sure that really was bothersome to the patient. Definitely looks like a big polypoid thing that's, you know, ulcerated on the surface. And then here's the path. All right. Let me hear from one of the, did any of the junior derm residents figure this out? I had two questions. One is what's the diagnosis? And number two is what's the bonus finding? Don't be shy. We thought maybe pyogenic granuloma. Very good. You thought correctly. This is like the biggest pyogenic granuloma or lobular capillary hemangioma, as they're also called, PG. Like the biggest one I've ever seen, probably. It's huge, and it is nice that we get to see the whole thing with the whole base and everything, because this was uh, taken off by a surgeon um, who, who removed it definitively. And I think, honestly, uh, that was probably good for the patient, because they were able to get all the way under it and, you know, to, to you know, cauterize the vessels or tie them off to hopefully minimize the chance of recurrence. Because you can imagine a shave through this, that thing's going to grow right back, probably. Um, the, the, the lesion is pedunculated here and sits on a stalk. It's got kind of some feeder vessels coming up to it from below. And um, the lobular shape is not as easy to see in this one. Sometimes they have a very nicely lobular shape, but I think here you can kind of appreciate there's a lobule of capillaries around a central vessel. Here's a lobule. Here's kind of a lobular shape here. And I think that's really helpful in vascular tumors that the lobularity often goes hand in hand with benign vascular processes. Um, and infiltration sometimes means malignancy, although not always. There are uh, plenty of examples of benign um, vascular things that have a kind of infiltrative growth. In the middle of a PG, it can look pretty busy. But when you see the whole thing out or when you see the edges, it tends to look much more organized. You can see like a nice, this is the edge of the lesion here. And there is a little bit more extension down here. But even down here, look, it's a lobule, see? So that can be helpful. Now, enough from low power, but the low power really helps with these things. But let's go in closer, take a look. And what we see here are uh, small vessels. They've got plump endothelial cells around them. There's a lot of cells in between the vessels. Many of these are going to be pericytes, which are actin-positive, modified smooth muscle cells that wrap around small vessels, okay? Um, there can be variable amounts of hemorrhage and inflammation, although the inflammation tends to be more prominent near the ulcerated surface. If you start seeing a bunch of neutrophils down in the middle of something that looks like a PG, what other things should you think about? There's a rare thing that can mimic pyogenic granuloma, but tends to have more neutrophils. Bacillary angiomatosis. Very good. Bacillary angiomatosis um, tends to have uh, a lot of neutrophils in it. And if I start seeing a bunch of neutrophils in the middle of a PG, I go looking around for those bacterial colonies. And I got a video on YouTube about that that you can go check out if you need. Sometimes there's a lot of hemorrhage and fibrin around the vessels. And just like any time you have a big ulcer, you can have the neutrophils coming out of the vessels can kind of give you a vasculitis-like appearance. So don't be surprised at that. And this, the vessel changes are similar to those we see in granulation tissue. And um, there's a lot of kind of overlap between what looks like granulation tissue and what's truly a pyogenic granuloma. Okay, so you guys know all that. This one has a ton of edema also. Uh, pretty nice example because we got a nice clinical and the nice full uh, path specimen. Oh, and one other thing I was going to point out, that the especially in the ones that are ulcerated, I feel like you see it more, the endothelial cells can get pretty plump. I mean, look at those guys. They're big and juicy. They're plump. They have large nuclei. Um, they look different than regular endothelial cells, and that's because they're actively growing and kind of probably have some reactive sort of changes related to the background inflammatory environment. And you can see mitoses. So large cells and mitotic activity is to me a normal feature of, py of pyogenic granulomas. I don't get real worried about those. If I start seeing like pleomorphism and really hyperchromatic nuclei, I might stop and give some thought to that. Uh, oh, I will tell you, I'm not might. I will stop and give some thought to that. And if, I, if I'm really concerned and I don't see the base of the lesion, then those there are occasional times if I'm not really sure or de if the clinical scenario is not quite right, that I'll either say watch it closely and if it comes back, completely excise it, or I'll have them go back and take more. That's the general rule I use for vascular things. If I've got any doubt, number one, you know, consider getting a consult. You can try stains, although a lot of times, like, you know, like the diagnosis of angiosarcoma, there's not a lot of stains that help you except maybe CMIC in the setting of post-radiation. But outside of that, 
you oftentimes are really kind of left with looking at the pattern and the, the cytologic features. So that, which is kind of frustrating, right? Vascular tumors are really fascinating, but there are a, a fair number of times you're left with making a big decision between benign and malignant based on the pattern without a lot of ancillary help. And so in, those, in any case, when I have a doubt, what I recommend is close follow-up because usually an angiosarcoma is going to show itself very quickly. Uh, they're often very quickly rapidly growing tumors, not always, but a lot of times they are. And so, um, you know, with follow-up, if, if, if you end up being wrong, um, hopefully that can be detected as soon as possible so that the uh, patient can get the right treatment quickly. Okay. Before we go to the bonus finding, let me show you the, um, the immunostains on this case, because for teaching purposes, I did immunostains here. I don't think we needed that for the diagnosis, but we just did them with no charge later for, for teaching. Uh, where are they? Oh, I already opened them. So this is an example of uh, CD31, which is an endothelial marker. And you can see what it, what it can help with is in cases where you have a very busy um, vascular lesion or where a very cellular vascular lesion, sometimes the vessels get so packed closely together in some vascular lesions that it's hard to see the lumens. And so it can look more like a solid sheet of cells um, this one was not so much that way, but sometimes that can happen and it can be very hard to tell like what the actual pattern of the vessels is. And I find that doing CD31, you can do ERG, although this is a time that I like CD31 better because it's a, it's a cytoplasmic and, and um, a membranous stain rather than nuclear. So it tends to give you these nice sharp lines around each vessel. And look at that, isn't that beautiful? You can see every single vessel space, even these small ones, tiny vessel, tiny vessel, tiny vessel. Each of these little things, you get these little tiny vessels and they're nice and well formed and you can see much more clearly here look at the lobular pattern there it really enhances and highlights that pattern again with practice you can usually do this on H&E but I have definitely found it helpful in certain cases um, that the CD31 stain can really uh, highlight that pattern and make it a little easier to visualize and also if we go down lower towards the stalk you can see here that the 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 lesion really does end there there's a little lobule here and then down here, there's a background dermal blood vessels that are kind of an uh, increased reactive number of them because of this inflamed ulcerated surface, and surely they're recruiting some new vessel growth uh, here. The one other thing I'd, oh, I take that back. This is not CD31, this is CD34, but it, it serves the same purpose. The reason I knew, how did I know this was CD34? Staining some like fibroblasts in there. Yeah, the normal dermis stains strongly with CD34. Okay, that's why it's helpful in DF because the background dermis will be positive. It'll be brighter at the edge of the DF and in the middle of the DF, it's wiped out. The same is true often in scar. So this is a lot of this stuff here is probably scar tissue kind of growing around because in scar tissue, you're getting granulation tissue comes in and replaces what used to be dermis. And then as it matures, it turns into scar and those, those dermal dendritic cells and fibroblastic type cells, I think there's some sort of dendrocyte. I don't have a full deep understanding of dendritic dermal cells, but there are CD34 positive dermal dendritic cells that, that populate the dermis. And when you cut out part of the dermis and then it fills in with scar, it takes a while to get repopulated by, um, by those, um, those cells. So I, uh, 34 is not, a, is not a specific marker for vessels, and in the setting of angiosarcoma, it can occasionally be lost, but there are certain times it helps. It's really good in Kaposi sarcoma, because Kaposi sometimes lose CD31. The um, HHV8 virus can cause downregulation of the CD31 molecule. The other thing is in um, uh, CD31 will stain histiocytes also, kind of a grainy, grungy stain. CD34 doesn't do that. So in this lesion here, there's like very little background. So the, the CD34 is quite clean in this lesion that has a background that's not normal dermis. But when you're looking at normal dermis in the background, CD34 can be pretty dirty and hard to interpret. So you can use different markers for different things. Okay. So that was more one for the people that are going into derm path and for the derm residents, I'm sorry, you probably won't need that for your real world. But I will also show you, I did as a flip side, the actin stain and actin to stain the pericytes. And oftentimes you get um, pericyte layer surrounding the vessels. Uh, this one was a little weak and it's not quite as, uh, not quite as uh, pretty. I guess I should have checked it before I uploaded but it can kind of help you because it gives you the negative image of what you saw in the CD31. All the background cells in between the little vessels, those are actin positive. And usually benign vascular things have a nice layer of actin positive pericytes surrounding each of the vessels 
angiosarcomas sometimes lose that, although not always. Dr. Weiss taught me this trick about that in cellular things, you can use a, a vascular marker plus actin to kind of see which cells are pericytes and background myofibroblasts and which cells are endothelial. And it does work sometimes, but I've definitely seen times where there were exceptions to the rule. So it's not, it doesn't always work, but it can, it can kind of help you out in a pinch um, when you're dealing with a challenging case and you need to get a better feel for the pattern. But here, I just thought it was nice for teaching. Now, did anyone find, uh, I, I, you can tell I like this case because I beat that to death, but uh, did anyone find out what the uh, bonus finding is? Then I said it was in the, near the base of the lesion. Did anyone see it? It's pretty are subtle. There, are there some nucleated red cells down there? There you go. There. You can, it's cool because you can see them even from low power. You can see this dark little areas there. And when we go close, you can see these guys here, they are round and super hyperchromatic, really dark, almost as like they're dark like lymphocytes, but as opposed to lymphocytes, they're even more perfectly round and they're little tiny ones, medium ones, and bigger ones. And I find that that, that feature, like perfectly round, really dark cells, kind of like lymphs, but of varying size, clustered together, erythrocyte precursors. These are uh, bone marrow elements, basically, that are arising here. And over here, there's some more of them. And also, oops, a little bit too far more of the erythrocyte precursors. And these cells right here, I think are probably myeloid precursors. So developing neutrophils basically. And you can see their, their chromatin is a little bit different. So this is basically what we see in bone marrow. So when it occurs out of the bone marrow, we call that extramedullary hematopoiesis. And it's a, a thing that can be seen occasionally in the skin. I have to tell you though, it, it's extremely rare, it, or at least I've only recognized it rarely. And the couple times I've seen it, this is the second case that I actually saw little foci of it in the middle of a PG. So I don't know what's going on if the PG is releasing some cytokine factor or something that's recruiting these cells there, but I've seen it two times in PG and I actually don't think I've ever seen an example of it otherwise um, in the skin. It's definitely well described, uh, but it's something that I've, I've rarely ever encountered, but I've seen it twice in pyoderma, I'm sorry, pyogenic granulomas, excuse me. I have to always check myself to not mix up the two PGs in name when I'm talking about it. So I thought that was pretty, pretty fun. Okay.